Well, I want to welcome everyone here this morning. This is the first lesson of our gospel meeting that we have on Are You the Benedict Arnold of the Lord's Army? We have Brother Robert Jones this morning with us. He's from Sedalia, preaches for the Sedalia Church of Christ. And if he seems a little bit off or strange this morning, he spent last night with us. So if he's that kind of way, you'll understand. But we do look forward to Robert's lessons. He'll be doing the lesson now and at the next hour as well. The lesson that he's doing now is why Benedict Arnold and I are alike. Where we started doing the lessons, uh, Jeff said, somebody said, well, who's Bart Benedict Arnold? So I figured we better explain who the man is. So Robert, without further ado, it's up to you. Good morning. It's good to see each of you here. Good to be here this morning. I want to thank uh, the congregation. I want to thank Don for the opportunity uh, to be able to speak here. Uh, what a joy it is to, to have that opportunity. I, I must admit, though, that Don asked me and gave me pretty much the choice of, of when I wanted to speak within certain times, of course, and uh, I I was willing to speak this morning, although I'm a little bit not sure about the title, Why Benedict Arnold and I Are Alike. So I, I kind of adjusted that, and it's Why Benedict Arnold and We Are Alike, because we're not getting up here confessing anything or, or such, but it is, a, it is a joy, again, to be here uh, with you. If you will, bow with me in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we humbly bow before you this morning in prayer. We pray that you will forgive us of any sins we have in our lives that would hinder our service to you, Father. Father, we pray that as we look at your word, we will uh, be diligent in our studies, that we will apply these things to our lives. We are grateful, Father, for, for your word, knowing that it guides us uh, in the way we should go and that we can look to it and learn about you and your way, Father. And Father, we again give you thanks for all of this. In Christ's most precious and holy name, amen. Well, I, I'm kind of surprised, I, I must admit, growing up, I, I've always liked history, and, and I must admit, I'm kind of surprised that anyone would not know the name Benedict Arnold. It is a name that we we are generally familiar with, and, and in looking at all of this and, and thinking about this, it kind of surprises me in that thinking of how long ago he lived and died, dying in 1801, that, that so many people still use his name, and it evokes such a thought. Uh, oftentimes, and kind of on a side note here, we hear people say it really doesn't matter about a name. You know, it doesn't matter what the church is called. None of that really makes any difference. Name doesn't matter. Of course, we understand it does. After all, I can assure you most women would not like the idea of being called Jezebel. They wouldn't like that. And most individuals wouldn't like being called a Benedict Arnold because even now, though he's long since been dead, we know that it still evokes uh, that negative feeling. It, it is an insult to be called such. Giving a little background uh, of Mr. Arnold, we'll say, Benedict Arnold, um, we know again that he... His name doesn't evoke such a positive idea. But the truth is, if you study him, his career began quite well. His service, his military career, serving the uh, Continental Army and, and such, he actually began, as we're going to see, uh, began quite well and was uh, highly, at least in some individual's uh, viewpoint, highly esteemed. But, of course, eventually he did betray uh, his side and change to the British side. We asked this morning, and as we go through this lesson, I want us to consider, and, and we can make it personal and ask, and each of us should ask, how am I 
like Benedict Arnold? How is it that I am like he is? How is it that Christians are like uh, Benedict Arnold? We begin by understanding that he, again, he served, at least to start with, quite faithfully. Looking at uh, the comment that Wikipedia Wikipedia has, uh, some information on him, reading a little bit here, it says that after joining the growing army outside Boston, he distinguished himself through acts of intelligence and bravery. His actions included the capture of Fort Ticonderosa, or Fort Ticonderoga, excuse me, in 1775, defensive and delaying tactics despite losing the Battle of Valcour Island on Lake uh, Champlain in 1776, the Battle of Ridgefield, Connecticut, after which he was promoted to Major General, operations and relief of the siege of Fort Stanwyck, and key actions during the pivotal battles of Saratoga in 1777 in which he suffered leg injuries that ended his combat career for several uh, years. He uh, attempted to enlist at the age of 14, but his mother would not uh, allow him to do so, but he did enlist at the age of 16. In 1775, he was promoted twice. He started in March of that year as a captain. By May, he was promoted to colonel, and then in September, promoted to brigadier general. And as has already been mentioned, he was, subsequently to that, uh, promoted to major general. So he had a a rather uh, good career uh, militarily. He did quite well doing uh, many things. But as we're going to see as we go through the lesson, even during that time, it was not all favorable. And as Christians, so often we are just the same, aren't we? We begin by uh, obeying the gospel, doing what God has told us to do in order uh, to be saved, and, and then we serve faithfully. And so many are doing, do just that. They faithfully attend worship service. They do not forsake the assembling of the saints, as the Word of God tells us in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. They faced various battle scars, just as he did. It's an amazing thing, studying uh, Benedict Arnold, that he continued to be injured in the same leg, his left leg. Every time he was injured, he ended up, I think it was three times, getting wounded in his left leg. And I believe it was the last time he said it would have been better to have been shot in the chest than to have been injured in his leg. But the, the Christian often faces battle scars. Perhaps we serve faithfully even going out and evangelizing. I know that that some of you at least were out yesterday going out and knocking on doors and and trying to tell others about the meeting and and share the good news with with individuals. And perhaps as Christians we, we begin in just that way. And we face persecution. If you've ever been out knocking doors... I can assure you that you've probably run into someone who has not well received you, has not wanted you there, did not want to hear the news, and treated you ill. But in truth, we understand that in America today, we are relatively free from persecution. Recent events and and just history suggest that that may not always be the case. There may come a time where we may face uh, more persecution, but... We are relatively free uh, from that. But we do understand that there are still those who do not like Christians. They do not want to hear the message. They do not want to learn the truth. And so they respond very negatively. They slam doors in your face. They tell you to get out of their yard. I've been told some have even had dogs sicked on them. And so perhaps just as he did, uh, the Christian begins his, his service to the Lord, his service in the Lord's army, very faithfully, serving uh, with distinction, if you will. But as we'll see with Benedict Arnold, when things don't go our way, it doesn't always stay that way. You see, Benedict Arnold had a problem where he, he desired to have money. 
Money's a good thing, I suppose, to have. It's beneficial if used properly, if viewed in the right way. But we know that so many get wrapped up in uh, the idea of having money. And he apparently liked having money. Uh, it is said that John Brown uh, made this comment of him. And, and they were not good friends, so whether or not it's a true statement or just his trying to slander him, uh, I believe if you study uh, further into it, it does appear that the statement would have been actually correct. But he said, money is this man's God, and to get enough of it, he would sacrifice his country. And indeed, that's exactly what he did. Uh, he was willing to take advantage uh, to, to get uh, that, uh, to get as much money as he uh, could. Again, I want to share with you a, a little excerpt here from Wikipedia and show you that he, that he had that view. Well, again, that's a comment I just read, uh, getting it straight here, but uh, he did seek after money uh, to uh, do so. He even made the statement, he said, having become a cripple, he had, in his military career, he attempted to, to gain money and would use uh, deceitful acts. Uh, again, calling back to the fact that uh, he did serve faithfully, but... He was not always uh, the way that he he was supposed to to be. Uh, he had uh, attempted to take advantage. He was put in in charge in Philadelphia, and he used some deceitful acts to try to make money, and and was ultimately thwarted in that. And he replied. As such, having become a cripple in the service of my country, I little expected to meet such ungrateful returns. It was ungrateful of the Americans, in his view, not to reward him and allow him to uh, sell things that he shouldn't and, and use uh, deceitful means to gain, to gain his riches. He would ultimately try to seek after uh, money, ultimately looking for, I believe it was uh, the indemnity of his uh, bills, having uh, the British cover his bills and pay him 10,000 pounds above that. So he looked for great riches. And, and Christians so often are in the same mind frame. Perhaps you've heard of the prosperity doctrine or prosperity theology. We see a definition here, again, from Wikipedia. It says uh, it is sometimes referred to as the prosperity gospel, the health and wealth gospel, or the gospel of success. It's a Christian, teaches a Christian religious doctrine that financial blessing is the will of God for Christians. And that faith, positive speech, and donations to uh, Christian ministries will increase one's material wealth. Based on non-traditional interpretations of the Bible, often with emphasis on the book of Malachi, the doctrine views the Bible as a contract between God and humans. If humans have faith in God, He will deliver His promises of security and prosperity. Confessing these promises to be true is perceived as an act of faith which God will honor. And brothers and sisters, there are many individuals that you can turn on the television and watch and you can see that that's exactly what they're teaching. I was talking to Don and Becky uh, last night and one such individual is Joel Osteen. I teased them and, and actually took out uh, my phone and, and turned on the stopwatch and time myself. And it took me 6.41 seconds, I believe it was. And in that amount of time, I can preach every sermon that that man ever preaches. And here it is. God loves you. He wants you to have everything you want. Trust Him. And He'll give you everything that you desire. And that's every sermon he ever preaches. If you listen to him, that's ultimately what he uh, will, uh, will preach. But he's not the only one. 
There are so many other individuals who, who teach uh, that doctrine. And as I told Don last night, that if you listen to the prosperity doctrine, the only one that is becoming prosperous from such doctrine is the one who is preaching uh, that doctrine. Because it is always that they are telling you that you need to send them money. And if you watch, many of them have elaborate homes, uh, jets that they have, and they'll buy new jets and, and have all of these things, and, and they do so well. And they preach prosperity. Just send money. Just trust in God. And of course, your, your trust is you send a seed and you, you give to them and, and it will all work out. But brothers and sisters, this is not what the Word of God tells us that we are to do. The Bible warns us, as a matter of fact, against covetousness. In the book of Luke, chapter 12 and verse 15, we are in fact warned against covetousness. And that is what we are talking about at this point. Luke chapter 12 and verse 15 I am, of course, reading from the King James Version. And it says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Too many individuals are focusing on what they can get. They look for, How can I uh, have money? How can I do these things? And their focus is on the wrong thing. In Matthew chapter 6, And verse 33, we are told to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things, Jesus says, all these things shall be added unto you. What things? Well, all we need to do to find out what things is to go back and read in context. You can go back to verse 19 and see how Jesus tells them and teaches us through the Word. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And he goes on and and uses, and, and what a wonderful teacher Jesus was, to be able to use illustrations. You go through and look at, at the different teachings At different times he's teaching, you can just see him pointing to uh, something and and teaching. And in this context, he he points to the lilies of the field. You know, don't worry about your your clothing. Don't worry about what raiment, what you're going to put on. So many individuals might say, but I want the thousand dollar suit. And all I've got is a hand me down. Well, it doesn't matter about such things. And and the Lord teaches here, don't worry about those things. Look at the lilies of the field, how they're they're clothed. You know, Solomon in all his riches wasn't clothed as they are, and they perish. The sparrows, you know, look at these these birds over here, the fowls of the air, verse twenty six. They don't sow, but they're provided for. They're taken care of. And it is an amazing thing to see and to stop and think about how God does provide for the least. We know the Word of God is it teaches us that the miraculous has ceased. But we still have the providence of God. And I have to admit, I can't sit here and say with 100% certainty that well, this is the providence of God or or that is or or whatnot because it's hard to define when is something just happening and when is it the providence of God. Using an illustration, and it might sound a little silly, I believe it was this past year, the State Fair. We're getting ready, of course, for the State Fair. And we have the booth there. And and I was manning the booth uh, one day and... There was a little dirt dauber landed there. We have a water cooler, and he landed on the water cooler and was uh, apparently he could see the the water through there, and he was attempting to get to the water, but he couldn't get any. So I just reached up, got a little bit, and put a drop or two on there, and he he went to drinking this water and then flew away. And I couldn't help but think, well, you know, 
Was that an opportunity to provide this dirt dauber with water that I was able to do this? And I know that may sound a bit strange to, to suggest such, but it just got me to thinking about the providence of God. And I'm not saying God sat here and said, well, here's this dirt dauber and he's going to be thirsty and so I'm going to put Robert there and he's going to provide him water. I'm not suggesting such. But it's just it, it just gets you to thinking about such things. And, and God does provide us, brothers and sisters, with what we need. He gives us the things we need. And, and we can trust in Him. I can assure you, I haven't had the biggest homes, the newest clothing. I don't eat filet mignon every day or anything like that. But I have never starved. I have never been without clothing. I have never been without the things that I need. And I don't fear that I'm going to have those problems. I can trust in the God in God, but I don't have to I don't have to seek after riches. But there are many who they don't get wealthy. They don't achieve that prosperity. And so what do they do? They decide I'm going to go over to the other side where I can do things that will make me more money because I can't do those things as a Christian. So I'll go over here and do these other things and then it'll be okay. We see also that Benedict Arnold also desired fame and glory. He was disgruntled that he was passed over for promotion. He offered to resign, but Washington would not accept it. Offered at least twice to resign his commission and, and was not permitted to do so. But he was desiring that he, he be promoted and, and others were being promoted in his stead. And he felt that he was not being properly recognized, though his military career would indicate that he deserved such. It's interesting, even when he was promoted to major general, he still wasn't happy. Because he felt that he had not been promoted because they recognized that they were wrong, but had been promoted because he had been injured again. And they felt sorry for him. And so they just kind of gave him this promotion to kind of make up for his injury and all. So even when he got what he wanted, he still wasn't happy. And so many times we find... Yeah, that's exactly what Christians are like. The name Diotrephes, many of us probably recognize that name in the book of 3 John. 3 John, verse 9. We see John does not speak well of, of Diotrephes. Verse 9, he writes, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. He goes on and says, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, pratting against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth, casteth them out of the church. Have you ever met? And I'm not asking you to point fingers or anything, so don't jump up, Bruce, and point at Don, but just... Have you ever met one of those individuals, a diatrophies? That's all they want is to be recognized and to have that preeminence. Oh, if I could be an elder, if I could be the preacher, if I could be a deacon, or if, if, if they would just recognize how valuable I am. I learned a long time ago, no matter how important you may think you are, no matter how important you may in fact be, you can be, people can live without you. They will go on and they will adapt to your not being there. I'm not suggesting that we're not all important in our own way. We all have value. Certainly, the Lord recognized the value we have. God sent His Son to die for us, to pay that price, to pay that ransom. Mark 10 and verse 45. So there is certainly an inherent value that each of us has. But it is not because we are indispensable. It is not because that we do something that no one else could possibly do. But so many Christians do have that problem. They 
are covetous, if you will, of fortune and fame, looking to have glory for themselves. But is this the attitude that Christ had? We look in Philippians chapter 2 and the first eight verses and we find that Jesus did not have such attitude. It was not Jesus' attitude to say, look at me, how wonderful I am. And believe me, if anyone could say how wonderful He was, Jesus could. The Son of God, deity Himself. He had much He could say about Himself and exalt Himself. But Paul here in Philippians 2 teaches that that's not what he did. Writing, he says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Brothers and sisters, friends, what that teaches us is that Jesus did not have to try to reach, did not have to try to attain to be equal with God because He is deity. He was equal with God. And yet here He humbles Himself, comes down, takes upon Himself the form of man, becomes a man, and dies on the cross. A curse. The Bible teaches us that it's a curse for a man to be hung upon a tree. And He took upon Himself that to die for us, to give us the opportunity to be saved. You see, Jesus didn't go around saying, look at me. Jesus didn't say, go around saying, you know, I'm so great and I should be recognized and everyone should just remember I'm more important than they are. Jesus went to the cross. And even prior to doing so, He still suffered greatly. If you've ever studied what happened to Jesus when they scourged Him and how that works. They take this, this whip, but it's not like just any whip. It has usually three little strips on the end and they put pieces of glass and pieces of metal on Him. And they, of course, they took his, his robe off, His shirt and, and His bare back. They would whip Him with this thing. And you can imagine what this is going to do to someone's bare back. And they tortured Him. And they did this, this terrible thing. And He went through all of it, though He had the power at any time to say, enough. He could have put a stop to it. They hung Him on the cross, ridiculed Him, mocked Him. Oh, yeah, you say you're, you're the Son of God. You say you can do this. Well, come on, just come off the cross and we'll believe you. I can't speak for anyone else. But I might with my imperfections, I might be inclined to come off that cross and show them a thing or two. But Jesus understood that wouldn't get anyone anywhere. That would not achieve what He came to achieve. And we can thank God that Jesus was better than that. That He did not come off that cross. He did not uh, do such. And the Word of God teaches us indeed that we are not to be worried about ourselves. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 8 and verse 5. Psalm 8 and verse 5, we read, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Hebrews 2 and verse 9 associates that text with Christ. Again, Christ humbled Himself, becoming a man, living as a man, and ultimately dying as a man. And not only did Jesus set that example, but the Word of God teaches us that He taught His disciples the very same thing. In the book of Luke, chapter 22, 
verses 24 uh, through 30. Luke chapter 22, verses 24 through 30. We read, and there was also a strife among them which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth? Is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth? Verse 28, Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. What is he telling them? He's telling them don't try to exalt yourself. Don't go around trying to be the greatest. And yet that's exactly what so many people professing to be Christians are doing, running around saying, look at me, I'm an elder. Look at me, I'm the preacher, or I'm serving as a deacon. Deacon, Look at me, how great I am. Or perhaps other things. Look at me, I contribute a great deal of money. I give of my time, I'm so important, they couldn't get around without me. Brothers and sisters, the Word of God teaches us not to have such attitude. Not to live that kind of life. Benedict Arnold had that problem. And too many Christians do as well. We also see that he had a problem with doubt. Again, we find that he, he doubted that the Americans could win. Wikipedia writes, a few days later, Green received a letter from Arnold where Arnold lamented over the deplorable and horrid situation of the country at that particular moment, citing the depreciating currency, this affection of the army and internal fighting in Congress for the country's problems, while predicting impending ruin if things would not soon change. Oh, it's all just falling apart. We can't succeed, so we might as well just quit. That's the attitude he had. And unfortunately, there are too many Christians who have that very attitude. Perhaps the attendance is what it needs to be. Oh, they start wringing their hands. People won't come. And it it is amazing to me over the years, even before becoming a preacher, the, the attitude that individuals will have. I've seen young families who attend a congregation where there really aren't very many young families. There are not a lot of kids. So what is their solution to that? We'll leave and go to another congregation where there are a lot of kids. And I can understand wanting your children to to be around other children. I understand that as a father. I know it quite well. But the solution to a shortage of young families, a shortage of children in the congregation is not to take the children out who's already there. It's to go out and bring more children in, bring more people in who are young families. The solution to, well, things just are falling apart. We don't have very many people coming. All the attendance has dropped. The solution is not, brothers and sisters, to leave. And I can say, and I'm going to be selfish visiting, I know I can say this because what are you going to do? You can't do a whole lot to me because I won't be here after today. But you can't fire the preacher either and expect that that's going to solve the problem. I've seen congregations and that's their solution. The attendance isn't what it needs to be, so it must be the preacher's fault. But unfortunately, they have the wrong attitude. It's not necessarily, I'm not saying the preacher may not be at fault in some way or another, but it is not his fault that the attendance is... is not what it needs to be. And the solution is not to grumble. The solution is not to run away, not to hide, not to quit and go to the other side and, and stop being what God 
would have you to be. First Corinthians chapter 3 and beginning in verse 6. An interesting text here that we all need to commit to our, our thoughts, commit to our, our hearts and, and remember this. Paul would write, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither, the, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Verse 8, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Have you ever stopped to think, Don and Becky and I were talking last night and I was pointing out John 17, the true Lord's Prayer. Jesus prays. And in verses 20 and 21, it it, it is interesting. If you go back and read there, guess who He was praying for? He's praying for you. He doesn't call your name out specifically, but if you read there in context, He is praying for us today and all those who will come after us. And what a joy it is. But one thing interesting about about this text is that we are laborers with God. Have you ever stopped to think about that? We're working with God. And God expects not that we do His part. God doesn't expect me to do your part. God wants me to do my part. You do your part and I can guarantee you He will do His part. And we need to remember that. And when we start thinking about the attendance and how things aren't, aren't necessarily going the way we want uh, it to go, we see that we're just not happy with it. The, again, the solution is not to throw up our hands and to, to leave. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 2, and verse 12. Psalm 2 and verse 12. The Word of God reads, Kiss the Son, lest ye be angry, and ye perish from the way when His wrath is kindled. But a little... Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. Trust in God, brothers and sisters. Psalm 7 and verse 1. O Lord my God, in Thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecuteth me, and deliver me. Psalm 11 in verse 1. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. Brothers and sisters, we show a lack of trust when we spend all of our time grumbling and complaining and wringing our hands and saying how things can't succeed because... We're doubting God when we're saying that. I don't have to wonder who's going to win because I already know who already has won. God has. And I can be a part of that victory if I will obey the Gospel and live faithfully for Him. And we need to keep that in our minds. We need to understand that that is the case. Brothers and sisters, so often, we find, and we're going to wrap this up. So often we find individuals who do just like Benedict Arnold did, spiritually speaking. They look about and they say, well, things aren't going the way I wanted them to go. I thought when I became a Christian and I started being a Christian, not that they're living completely faithful, But, you know, I I became a Christian and I just was sure God was going to bless me and give me all this great wealth. And He hasn't. Oh, I was sure when I got down there among all those Christians down there, well, they'd recognize how important I am. And they would appreciate my value. But they haven't. Oh, you know... I just surely thought things would be better, but you know, those Christians, they're not perfect people. They're, they're all messed up down there. They're imperfect individuals. They, they, they complain and they act up and they do things they shouldn't be doing. And You know, what, what's anything special about them? And so I'll just throw up my hands and I'll quit and I'll go to the other side and I'll serve the, 
the enemy. Brothers and sisters, if we do that, we're forgetting an important thing. We're forgetting why we are here to serve God. And we are, in fact, becoming a Benedict Arnold. Brothers and sisters, how will people remember you someday? We stop and think, and a couple of hundred years from now, most of us probably won't even be remembered. And that's okay. But God will know us. How will He look down on you? Will He think of Robert Jones? Will He think of Don Boyd? Will He think of you? Well, that was somebody who was nothing better than a Benedict Arnold, a traitor. Someone who I couldn't trust in. Someone who I couldn't depend upon. Wouldn't be faithful. Or better yet, and and we won't read it, but I encourage you to sit down on your own and read Hebrews chapter 11. Longer than 200 years have passed since all of those individuals have died. Read what God has to say about them. And how wonderful they were. Not perfect. Because I can assure you, you can go look at their lives and you won't find one of them that was perfect. But God could say they were faithful. Let us all be faithful and serve the Lord.